I have left those that I love as my own life behind, and risked everything and endured many hardships to get here. I want to make enough to live easier and do some good with before I return. S. Schufelt The desire to better one's life, and that of those whom they love and care for, is an inherent trait in human beings. Men and women from all over the globe traversed mountains, endless prairies, and navigated immense expanses of ocean in the attempts to do just that during the gold rush. Major world events, like the California Gold Rush, act as catalysts for dramatic changes in culture, the world, and everyday people's lives. This discovery causes the single largest mass migration in American history, bringing roughly 300,000 new people to California. These events also contain many universal qualities that draw people from all walks of life. Gold was resting in a riverbed, waiting to be found. It was almost an unbelievable concept, yet it represented a chance at freedom for so many across the world. This was a chance for men and women to escape the lies they had, for a chance at a better, brighter future. In America at the time, taking such bold chances, such as a cross-continental migration, along with the speculation for wealth, was a rare act. Quite literally, overnight, the discovery of gold in the American River changed all that. However, the discovery of gold brought about changes that did not positively affect all people. There were those who hailed from foreign lands, as well as the American Indians and the Californios. During the course of the rush, many of them would face harsh racism and prejudices from the white miners. The California Gold Rush was a magnet that drew those eager to change their lives. It pulled people in from every corner of the world. The 49ers called themselves Argonauts, after the band of heroes in Greek mythology who searched for the Golden Fleece. In addition to the thousands of Americans and Native Americans who sought out gold, people came from Mexico, Chile, Australia, China, Canada, Hawaii, and from all over Europe. The Mexican-American War ended a mere nine days after the first glimmer of gold was discovered in the American River. Word had not yet reached either country's capital. If it had, perhaps the Mexicans would not have surrendered California, and history would have been shaped very differently. Some of the first people to reach the newly found gold were Mexicans. These men and women now found themselves returning to familiar ground, but it was now in a foreign land. California was no longer theirs, yet it did not stop them from traveling, often with their entire families, to the gold fields of California. Many were quite experienced in the art of gold mining, and this fact would not be lost on the less capable, yet more entitled minds of the newly arriving Americans. It did not take long before prejudice and racism took hold of the fevered souls who made up the gold rush. With the influx of so many new people from distant countries, and so far from the eyes of the politicians back in Washington, at the time, California was ungoverned and prejudice was let loose in many parts. The Far East was not exempt from the alluring pull of the gold rush. California sees an influx of nearly 23,000 people from China over the duration of its period. California draws the Chinese people across the Pacific and towards her shores for several important reasons. The eastern shore of China was a shorter distance to the west coast of America than it was to the eastern portion of the United States. And for those wishing to leave China, this decision was clear-cut. 
Another factor was the Tiaping Rebellion, which left many of the Chinese in the southeastern parts of China in poverty, and the chance at discovering riches in California was a way out of the despair that they were facing in their homeland. In the early days of the gold rush, Chinese immigrants were treated very well by the Americans. Most people were to see them as an exotic addition to the rapidly changing landscape of California. In addition to this novelty, the East Asians add to the melting pot of San Francisco. The Chinese immigrants would often take the most unsavory jobs that an average white man might deem beneath him, and they would work it for a fair and decent wage with no complaint. Many of the Chinese immigrants chose to open their own shops and establishments. They could be found mending clothing, tending bars, cooking meals in restaurants that they owned, cleaning clothes, and housing many a weary miner, along with filling any hole that needed to be filled in the burgeoning gold rush economy. In the beginning, it was not uncommon to see whites patronizing the establishments of Chinese immigrants. The governor of California was even counted as saying that the Chinese were one of the most worthy of our newly adopted citizens, McDougal. Those Chinese that did decide to try their hand at mining would often select claims that had already been abandoned by whites. And with a more patient attitude, they would be able to root out the gold that the more impassioned and impetuous Americans might leave behind. These men often worked in groups of 50 or more to help ward off would-be attackers and those who would attempt to capture the claims from them. These resourceful men also take added measures to protect the gold that they find. While they are still in the field, the men cover the extracted gold with soot as to conceal its true nature from any passerby. And then, when they returned home, they would melt it into pots and pans and other household items to further hide the gold's true identity from sight. The Chinese immigrants enjoy a mostly warm welcome in the Gold Rush Society of San Francisco, California, but their good fortune does not last for too long. Once the rivers, streams, and hillsides are picked clean of the placer gold, which is relatively easy to obtain, the Americans' attitude towards the once herald Chinese workers began to shift. Fresh miners are constantly coming into the fields and since the easy gold is no longer to be found, the Americans, in their frustration and disappointment, begin to take it out on the Chinese. The various jobs and trades, such as launderers, cooks, and cleaners, that the Chinese immigrants hold are now becoming coveted by miners who have given up the dream of finding riches. These necessary yet undesirable holes that needed to be filled in the Gold Rush Society are the only sources of income that is consistent. The Americans accuse the Chinese of stealing these jobs from them and driving down wages. Discrimination becomes prevalent as the Americans see these jobs as a way out of the hole they've made, and they are not about to let these immigrants take this last chance from them. The Irish potato famine, which begins in 1845 and lasts until 1852, deprives the country of more than one million lives and more than a million more who immigrate to another nation. The famine causes Ireland's population to drop almost 25%. Many who escaped the famine immigrated to the east coast of the United States. New York was one of the most prominent gateways to the nation. Those who chose to continue westward were most likely to be unmarried men or men who would marry later in their lives once in California. These later-in-life marriages were a common trend in Irish-American famine survivors, both on the east and west coasts. The life of an Irish-American on the west coast was often very different than the lives of those who chose to remain back east. Irish in the east are quick to set up communities and neighborhoods that remained mostly traditionally Irish. Even in their choices of occupation, such as police officers and firefighters, 
they tended to flock together and would dominate that profession. Conversely, in California, the lifestyle was much different. Many Irish found the standard of living much better than back in New York. The Western society was more open, and occupations and communities were far less dominated by one ethnicity. San Francisco was underdeveloped, though rapidly growing, which created many opportunities for Irish Americans to find the economic stability and commercial opportunities that had been lacking in New York. The Irish take the knowledge and experience that they had acquired in Boston or New York and carry it with them to California, where there is a demand for skilled laborers. In addition to these new economic horizons, the Irish also experience tolerance for their Catholic religion and their more rural ways of life. While bigotry is by no means extinct in Gold Rush era California, attitudes are far better than those found on the East Coast. In response to an outcry from German and Irish Americans regarding the Chinese and Mexican miners in California in 1850, the state legislature enacts the foreign miners tax for all those not born in America or who have not gained proper citizenship via the Treaty of Guadalupe Hildago. The law imposes a tax of $20 per month on any foreign person wishing to mine in California. This tax, which is far too high for the majority of Mexican and Chinese miners to afford, is motivated by economics as well as racism from the Americans of European descent. Within a year of the foreign miners tax, 10,000 Mexican miners leave California. The law is not meant to produce revenue for the state, but rather to exclude non-Americans from reaping the benefits of gold mining. Thousands of Mexicans and Chinese return home, but many did stay and continued to be driving forces in the development of California. The Chinese went on to help build the Transcontinental Railroad. The lives that Chinese immigrants made in America, even with all the prejudices and setbacks, were a far better option than returning to China. Many Chinese persevered and found new ways to succeed in the midst of the rush. Hua Li was one such individual. Once he gave up his attempts at mining for gold, spending grueling days under the unforgiving California sun, running water through a pan or a rocker, he turned to the laundry business and found that running water over dirty trousers would be a much more profitable and stable business. In 1851, Hua Li opens the first Chinese laundry business in San Francisco. By 1870, there would be over 2,000 of them in the city. Levi Strauss was born in Germany in 1829. He and his family came to America to start a new life and open a dry goods store in New York City. The family sent Levi out west in early 1853 to open up a West Coast branch of their company and to take advantage of the still booming California gold rush. Strauss traveled west and set up shop in San Francisco. It did not take long for his dry goods store to become a success. He opened up several locations and would often give generously to charities and religious causes. In 1872, a customer of Strauss, who had purchased some cloth from him, asked Levi to help cover the costs of a patent on a new kind of durable pants. That man's name was Jacob Davis. Strauss agreed, and their venture would lead to the famous blue jeans that we still know today. It is easy to imagine some of those early pairs of Levi's trousers passing through the wash of Mr. Wa Li. These two men persevered and found success in those early days of California. Not all that tempts your wondering eyes and heedless hearts is lawful prize, nor all that glitters gold.
Thomas Gray. The fates and fortunes of Samuel Brannan and James Sutter could not be more in contrast. Their individual tales show us a unique side to the multifaceted story that is the California Gold Rush. They are unique inasmuch as that one man became rich off the gold rush and the other lost most everything, yet neither of them fell into the category of a true miner, Argonaut, or 49er. Brannan saw an opportunity in the sale of goods to those who wished to take their chances in the minefields, and he took it. He did not make his money by digging in the dirt, but by selling the implements that others would dig with. He also helped to fuel the propaganda machine that would be a catalyst towards mobilizing thousands of Americans and people from all walks of life throughout the world. Samuel Brannan had the California gold rush literally walk right up to his front door. Men came into his shop who were from Sutter's Mill, and they paid for goods with gold flakes that they had found in the American River. Brannon foresaw the coming fever, and when that fever did hit, he adapted to it very quickly. He became the first millionaire in the California gold rush, yet spent almost no time hunting for gold. His money was made less by chance and more so by calculation. The commodity he dealt in was not gold, but hope. He knew that those who were hunting would come to him in need of the necessary tools and goods, and when they did, he was ready to sell them all that they needed, and at a very healthy profit. His empire would expand beyond general stores and the sale of goods. It would quickly move into the construction of hotels to house the eager Argonauts that flooded his city and into wharves to house the ever-expanding amount of goods that arrived daily upon the crowded shores of San Francisco. John Sutter was first on the scene. In fact, the scene was a piece of his land. The accidental finding of gold in the American River by James W. Marshall at Sutter's Mill in 1848 would forever alter the fates of thousands upon thousands of people around the globe. What was only a small, shimmering object in the water would become a catalyst for change in the nation change in what it meant to be an American, and for California rushing headlong into statehood. No state had come into the Union before first spending its fair share of time as a territory first. The never-before-seen rush of people and the ensuing boom of San Francisco and other neighboring cities would prove to be an impetus that would help thrust California into statehood as well as pushing it into the spotlight on the world stage. John Sutter had plans to become rich off the land in a more traditional sense. In addition to his mill, he had a sizable agricultural empire in New Helvetia, also known as New Switzerland. And his plans for farming and raising cattle were quickly washed away, like the sand and the silt in the pan of an eager miner. Word had spread that there was gold at Sutter's Mill, and nothing could stop the squatters that would come. Sutter would spend most of the rest of his life trying to regain his land or receive compensation for its loss from the U.S. government, but he would never attain such satisfaction. Antonio Franco Coronel was born in Mexico City in 1817. He moved to Los Angeles at the age of 17 with his father, Ignacio, who was a former officer in the Mexican army. Antonio would also go on to serve in the Mexican army and would fight the United States in the Mexican-American War. On the heels of Mexico's defeat came the news that gold had been found in Northern California. This news sparked Antonio's imagination 
and he would soon become one of the early miners to arrive at the scene. He brought with him about 30 people, which included some Native American servants, to help with the digging. Within the first three days of their labor, over $2,000 was pulled from the earth. Cornell and his men continued to have success during the 1848 season and on into the next year. In the early days of the rush, people of all nationalities worked side by side without much trouble or disagreement. The gold was in abundance and easy enough for all to find. Cornell's success in the gold rush was stunted when his claim was invaded by armed Americans threatening to kill him and his workers if they did not surrender it to them. This was an ever-increasing act, Americans intimidating and threatening those that they deemed foreigners who were mining claims that they believed by all rights belonged to them. Cornell wisely chose to give up his claim, thus ending his tenure as a gold prospector. The source of the antipathy towards Mexicans was that the majority of them were Sonorans, men of expertise in gold mining, and consequently, they quickly attained the best results. Although his success in the California gold rush was short-lived, this was only the beginning of the success that Cornell would enjoy during his lifetime. He goes on to become the mayor of Los Angeles, a city councilman, and the state's treasurer. His story is atypical of the Argonaut working on the mines, inasmuch as he found success quickly and he was able to cease before the greed and the harsh lifestyles overtook him. Many more found no luck in life and no luck in the California ground. Hiram Pierce was one such man. Hiram and Sarah Pierce were living in Troy, New York, when word of the riches being found in California reached them. It did not take long for this blacksmith and father of seven to fall ill with gold fever. In March of 1849, Hiram set off for California by way of Panama. His poor health did not stop him from seeking out an easier and quicker way to better his family's situation. He endured the long and treacherous walk across the isthmus of Panama, passing dead mules along the way, and by sheer luck avoided the diseases such as yellow fever and malaria that dwelled in the jungles all around him. Hiram made his way finally to San Francisco. Prices for goods were exorbitantly high, but Hiram was at a loss and had no choice but to accept the costs of doing business in the mines. It had not taken long for the landscape to dramatically change. Gone are those early days of the gold rush, where miners of many creeds and colors effortlessly worked side by side and pulled riches from the ground. It had already transformed into a cold, calculating business that preyed upon the hopes and fragile dreams of those men who succumbed to a very different kind of yellow fever. Sarah Pierce, was forced to become the head of the household in Hiram's absence. She had seven mouths to feed and had to become quite resourceful in order to do it. She rented out their blacksmith's shop, called in debts that were owed to Hiram, and borrowed money from relatives. Sarah Pierce's experience was not unique among women who stayed east in the gold rush. In the void that was left behind, when the men of the house left to try their chances at riches, wives and mothers stepped in to take on all of the household duties, in addition to the heavy burdens that they already carried. Many women did this not knowing when their husbands would return home to them, or if the journey and the heartache would reap any financial rewards. Hiram's time in the mines earned him nothing more than a homesick heart and a gaunt face brought on by malnutrition. Upon his return to New York over a year later, his physical appearance had changed so much that friends had trouble recognizing him. Hiram Pierce returned to blacksmithing, but he never stopped talking 
about returning to the mines. He died before he could ever renew his dream of returning to the West. His stories and his dreams enchanted some of his children, and after his passing in 1866, they too ventured westward to make their lives in California. Though the majority of the wives, sisters, and daughters of the men during the age of the gold rush stayed behind on the home front, not every woman's story was like Sarah Pierce's. Women were in fact there in the mines from the very start. Many of the first to break soil and begin the hunt for gold were those who already lived in California, and entire families would go out into the gold fields to mine together. The native peoples of California would be sifting gold through woven baskets, and women played a major role in that effort. As the deluge of people from all over the world rushed into San Francisco Bay and beyond, the ratio of men to women in San Francisco and the surrounding mines quickly becomes at least 10 to 1. This ever-growing disparity creates a male-dominated society. Men would go weeks, even months, without even the sight of the opposite sex. This one-sided way of living and the long, exhausting hours of toiling out in the rivers and the mountains soon causes many of the men to crave the company of the fairer sex. Miners would pay top dollars for almost any good or service that was made by a woman's hand. A woman waiting tables or mending clothing could be making a better wage than the average miner. After all, the majority of the 49ers relied on speculation and pure luck to make money, while these simple jobs that women held were in high demand and there was an ever-growing number of men to call upon these services. As the transportation routes became more consistent, more women came west. Husbands who decided to make California their new home sent for their wives. New relationships were conceived via letter and proposals made from across the continent. These women would often be married almost immediately upon landing in the San Francisco Bay. Single women also made the journey westward, and many did not have sufficient funds to afford the cost of the trip, so they signed on with brothels, saloons, and the like. Their passage would be paid for in full by their new employer. In exchange for this payment, these girls agreed to a contract to work for the establishment for a set period of time. A home-cooked meal or a darned sock was not the only product or service that saw a spike in price and demand in the wide open land of chance and opportunity that was California. Men sought the company of women, and they often sought more than just casual conversation. Nearly all these women at home were streetwalkers of the cheapest sort, but out here for only a few minutes. They ask a hundred times as much as they were used to getting in Paris. Albert Bernard. The sex trade was not exempt from the inflation in prices that was prevalent in almost all goods and services during the period of the gold rush. The prices that men paid for tools, meals, rooms to rent, were high even by today's standards, with the same being true of the world's oldest profession. Once again, we see more consistent money being made not in the mines, but coming out of the pocketbooks of those who dig. Some of these women choose the route of prostitution out of necessity in order to pursue their dreams of a new life out west, and some were part of the profession before they ventured from their homes. In either case, this was not the path of all women who found themselves in California during this period of time, and it is certainly not the path of Luzina Wilson. Farewell, dear wife. Keep up good cheer. There's glittering scenes before me. You soon with me the wealth shall share that lays in California. The gold hunter's farewell to his wife. 
Mason Wilson was no different than the rest of the masses who were wooed by the promise of fortune in California. His mind was made up to uproot himself from his home in Missouri and make the trek. He would not have to go alone. His wife, Luzina, insisted that wherever he went, so could she and their two children. Soon after Mason's decision, they would make the journey together into the great open plains. Once the family arrived in Sacramento, it was not a fact lost on Luzina that there were very few women to be found in the surrounding areas. In a six-month stay in Sacramento, only a few other women were seen by this new Westerner. One day, while she was cooking dinner for a family, a man came up to her and offered her money for her biscuits, more money than would be reasonable in any other place in the country at that time. He offered her upwards of $10, to which she scoffed. When the man upped the offer, she realized that he was in earnest, and thus began Luzina's journey into the business of feeding and housing the masses who sought out the gold. After a few days in Sacramento, the family sold their oxen and purchased a stake in a small hotel. The kitchen gained popularity because the men craved a meal that was cooked by a woman, and more importantly, it gave them a small respite from the coarseness and hard labor of their everyday lives. A home-cooked meal was worth more than its weight in gold to these weary men. In the winter of 1850, the levees broke in Sacramento, and it was enough to damage the Wilson's property along with their barley crop. Word had spread that miners were striking it rich in Nevada City, and that information was enough to set the Wilsons onto another path to a new city. They once again became successful in Nevada City, but fires burned down their establishment, and once again they were without a home. The Wilsons would face more hard times and fires that would take their property, but Luzena never gave up, and she used every penny the family had to remake it again and again. Her perseverance keeps the family afloat and ensures that they would not succumb to the same fates that so many of the Argonauts who ventured out west in the hopes of quick riches would. In 1872, Mason Wilson would abruptly leave his family, abandoning them for Texas. Luzena persevered and lived another 30 years without him. Her story is a shining example of the strength of character in the women who ventured out to California during the time of the gold rush. Really, everybody ought to go to the mines just to see how little it takes to make people comfortable in the world. Louise Clapp. A meal made by someone such as Luzina Wilson is a short respite for these men who have been hardened by the coarse San Francisco culture and an opportunity to dine at a proper table is like a small island of civility for many of the rough and tumble men who pass through these many mining towns and sleep in crudely made tents or cabins in hastily constructed camps every night. It was a little bit of home. A meal such as this most likely also contained the much needed vitamins for the miner, since malnutrition is quite common among the men. Their health also suffered from sleeping on the damp ground or being in close quarter bunks with many other men who were in the same lot as they were. The constant gnawing impulse to get back out in the fields especially for those who have found no luck as of yet, is only one of the daily worries that these men face. Many of the Argonauts are thousands of miles from their homes and families. Loneliness runs rampant among the miners as they pine for what they left behind. Each day of mining begins in darkness and does not end until the sun goes down. The mining business is a repetitive grind that often yields only a few dollars worth of gold. Sometimes a day's labor does not even cover the costs of doing business for the day. These long hours and the exhausting work, along with the terrible food, harsh climates, 
and the dwindling amounts of placer gold puts the stress levels even higher on each of these men, some of which results in racial outbursts towards the aforementioned foreigners. S. Schufelt was one such miner who braved life in the camps. No one knows what became of Mr. Schufelt, whether he succeeded in striking it rich, or if he returned home to Wyndham, New York in failure. Even his first name remains a mystery. The only piece of his life story that remains is in a letter that he wrote to his cousin in March of 1850. In this letter, he details what he saw around him. His keen observations on the living conditions and the lives of the men who endured these less than ideal conditions leaves little to the imagination. Many, very many that come here meet with bad success and thousands will leave their bones here. Others will lose their health, contract diseases that they will carry to their graves with them. Some will have to beg their way home, and probably one half that come here will never make enough to carry them back. But this does not alter the fact about the gold being plenty here, but shows what a poor, frail being man is, how liable to disappointments, disease, and death. The California gold rush burst onto the world stage with the help of Sam Brannan's prodding. The gold rush boasted of fantastical stories of average men just bending down and reaching into a river and picking out their new life's fortunes overnight. It seemed too good to be true, but early on, it was not. Now that the word of the findings had become widespread, most of the gold that could be easily plucked from a riverbed with little to no skill or effort had all been mined making even just a day's wage was becoming more difficult for the Argonauts. Mining was slowly becoming more of a skilled trade for those who had the money to implement the more advanced mining techniques, such as hydraulics or dredging the entire river. Men were becoming mere employees of these corporations, earning a daily wage, which was no different than the lives they left back home. These men and women ventured westward in hopes of finding freedom and independence from the limiting jobs and life circumstances that they faced back home. But now, they were once again just another cog in another machine. But the bold did remain. Those who chose to go it alone or work with a small group. These miners faced an uphill battle. The average 49er works a six-day work week with only Sunday as a day of respite. Those that did not stay at camp would often venture into a town to seek out means by which they could ease their minds. As a source of comfort in their off time, the miners often turned to dancing and singing and listening to music to fight off the lonesomeness and the stresses that they constantly felt. While California held the promise of making a new life, it was still a mostly untamed land and many of the creature comforts that could be found back east were a rarity out west. Another form of escape is alcohol. It was not uncommon for men to turn to the bottle or to the company of prostitutes or to games of chance to keep their minds off of their situations and to buoy their hopes against the fact that they may never find that mysterious payload that they had traveled so far and exhausted so much of their energy to root out. A biting irony of the gold rush is that these men slave away all day in the hills and the rivers to pull a few dollars of precious metal out of the earth, only then to carelessly spend it in one day on liquor and women and games of chance. For so many who came out west, their mission was to find riches and then to return home to their families, their towns, and their former lives. Without even knowing it, with every shovel of dirt that they dug, panned, sluiced, or dredged, they were building themselves a new life in California. They are wagering their future for one night of numb exhilaration and a chance to forget their lonesomeness, if only for a while. California was quickly filling up with these men who were so full of hope and ambition. 
Many of these men arrived with little left to their names after the long journey westward. They have no home other than the ground they sleep on, and they had no family other than their fellow man who slept next to them. But despite all this, their spirit for the manifest destiny shines as a kind of beacon to the world. While the fates of the Argonauts are often left to chance, it's becoming clearer and clearer that California's fate will be one of the highest order.